Okay, I think we'll get started. It's now 12.06 by my uh, Apple clock. So welcome, welcome everyone uh, to this um, free online public lecture in our in our online lecture series. I think we're up to uh, our, our like 12th or 13th lecture. This has been a product of the pandemic, which we like and which will uh, continue after things return to normal if that ever happens um, uh, because it's so convenient uh, to be able to get people from all over the world together to talk about things and um, my name is Jason Petticone I'm the president and founder of the Pi Day Institute and I'm very pleased to be here introducing Laura Manning who I've known for a long time because she has been a avid participant in um, many Paideia events through the last decade, uh, most notably our Living Latin and Greek in New York City conference where she's um, presented and, and taught and other things. So um, for those of you who don't know Laura, Laura is a Latin teacher. Um, she has taught <clears throat> Latin at all, all levels, um, but has a specific uh, focus on teaching high school students. And, um, after a um, career uh, teaching, uh, teaching Latin, Laura decided to go back in uh, 2014 to uh, do a PhD, uh, where she, which she first, first did a master's and then a PhD uh, at the University of Kentucky, where she also participated in the well-known uh, Institutum uh, Studis Latinis Pro Vehendis uh, with <clears throat> Terence and Milena Tunberg, who are both here in the virtual audience. Hi to both of you. Um, so Laura earned her PhD there in education sciences with a focus on um, active Latin pedagogy and investigating uh, teaching the, the, the historical um, or the, the history of teaching Latin via the active method. So um, we uh, at Paideia in this talk series were thinking, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to hear from a teacher who has been, you know, kind of in the trenches during the pandemic um, to talk about online teaching. But, uh, and so we reached out to Laura for that just because she is, when we think of, you know, who's a great, uh, really skilled high school Latin teacher, she's the first person who, who, who comes to mind. But uh, we got even more than we asked for because in addition to that topic, uh, she's also able to talk about uh, the use of active Latin um, uh, in that situation, which is, which is uh, which I think it's probably very well adapted for. So um, that's just great. And I'm really looking forward to hear this talk. So thank you very much, Laura. And I, uh, I leave the floor as it were to you. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Thank you for that really kind introduction, Jason. Can everybody hear loud enough? Awesome. Let me share my screen. And there we go. So I wanted to talk to you today uh, from the University of Kentucky and from Humanitas. Um, which runs the conventicula uh, about active Latin today during the pandemic. And in general, um, what I found is things that I'm doing pertain not only to pandemic times, but I think they're going to pertain kind of to every situation that we find ourselves in. So for me, the focus is teaching the elements of Latin, beginning Latin to students so that they're invested in it, that they want to learn. They're using Latin while they're learning to read Latin. And I find that this is most helpful. So I'd like to divide my remarks into four kind of categories. First, some questions that guide my teaching in general and some societal influences on Latin teaching through various time periods. 
highlights from my research study and probably the part that uh, I guess you want the most is implications for the classroom, what I'm actually doing with it all. So some of the guiding questions, when I start out, I ask my students, who are you? Um, I've been teaching now at the University of Kentucky, so these are college students now. But I get similar answers from the college students when I ask, who are you and why are you here? Uh, questions that I want to focus on, focus the students on themselves, uh, because they think that everything they're going to get comes from the outside. And really, I find that I want to build from within. So what do the students want from the course? I get a lot of I want vocabulary. Since the pandemic, I found that, that we have a lot of students who are biology majors who want to go into a health field, and they want vocabulary that's going to support them. So this is a, a, a big requirement that they have. But also, they've heard about our reputation at the University of Kentucky, and they want to learn how to speak some Latin. They, they've said this to me. Um, but also, I need to find out what kind of experiences the students are bringing to the course. You get different people every time, and building on their interests, um, I find, helps them to be invested. Um, you'll also have little jokes in the class where certain vocabulary words are favorites of students. We've been doing a lot of sentences about horses because we're here in Lexington and it's the horse capital. Um, so it really depends on the students and what they want. But the most important question that I ask myself every day when I step into a classroom, if today's the last Latin that students are ever going to get, what's it going to be like? What's going to happen for them? Um, and, and what do we have to give them that they can take away and keep forever? You've gone to a party pre-pandemic time. Someone puts a drink in your hand and they say, so what do you do? And you, you tell them you're a Latin teacher. And usually one of two things happens. Either they take a step back and they say, whoa, um, I see some smiles. Maybe that's happened to some of you. Or they'll start to decline a noun, conjugate a verb, or recite some Caesar. Those are the, my experiences. And I'm, I'm always compelled to award them an A for that performance. Um, but I wonder if declining a noun and conjugating a verb is all they remember 20, 30, 40 years later. Is that really what I wanted for them? Is that what I had in mind? What are the students going to gain from the course? Um, so this is really important to me. So stopping for a minute to go back to what does Latin have to offer? Um, when I did my research study, I thought a lot about what Latin has been like through the ages. So it was people's first language in Rome. If you came to Rome without knowing Latin, you were in a kind of a second language environment. Everyone's speaking Latin and you need to learn it for survival. You need to learn it to do everything that you do. And Latin continued to be used and changed but it was used widely in the Middle Ages as well, more for clergy and educa educated people are using one form of Latin, but very widely used. When we moved to the Renaissance, it, th there was a huge change. The Renaissance itself was a huge change. And a big part of that change came to the way Latin was viewed and what its purpose was. It's used in the schools. Educated people need to understand literature. They need to be able to speak eloquently. They need to be able to write letters to each other. This is, this is something that people did. And in this part, I'm thinking about even women were starting to be educated uh, in Latin again. It wasn't just the people who could go to school. Um, there was kind of a, a period where fathers wanted to teach their daughters Latin. And I'm thinking of an example of Cassandra Fideli, whose, whose father seems to have taught her Latin, and she was really good at it. She learned Greek as well. And at 12 years old, she went off to get some more polish on her Latin to the point where she was interacting with educated people throughout uh, 
the, throughout the day, they were, she was um, corresponding with a lot of luminaries, including uh, Queen Isabella of Spain, who herself could read and write in Latin. Uh, not something that I had thought about before when I was a high school student. Uh, but then something happened around in the 18th century where Latin was no longer the language of commerce. It was no longer the language of the government. People were using French to do a lot of their work. And so the need to speak Latin very well had fallen off through this time. And this changed the way we looked at teaching it because we didn't have enough teachers who could speak Latin fluently enough to be able to teach it that way. So these are things that I had in mind as I entered into my research study. And again, as I'm going into my classroom every day, thinking about what is Latin going to do for my students? What can I help them with? So my research study took me to three schools in Kentucky three different teachers who said that they spoke Latin actively. This was the only way that I um, decided who would be in my study based on them saying, asserting that they taught Latin actively. And they were so generous in their time. I observed their classes. I typed up transcripts of everything that was said in the classes. And then I kind of analyzed all of that information at length. It took me a very long time uh, to look at what was being said and what I could make out of it. And the connection that I made was that in these classes, these teachers were using reading, writing, speaking, and listening. They weren't doing just one of these things. They weren't only reading and translating. Uh, they weren't only writing composition sentences from Latin to English or translating sentences from English to Latin. They weren't only doing that. They weren't only speaking to their students in Latin and their students listening to Latin and maybe repeating a couple of key phrases. Students were doing all of it. They were reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And what I really found that was interesting is that the balance of the communication modes appeared to have an effect on students' test scores certainly a correlation there. The greater the balance between the reading, writing, speaking, and listening, the better the students did on the test that I gave them. And that was a national Latin exam test. I, um, I analyzed it just because this was something that I figured all Latin teachers were at least familiar with this and would understand what was being asked in the questions. And we don't have really another test. So rather than making a new test, I used this old test. So with all of that in mind, I need to revisit the questions. If today's that last Latin day, what's it going to be like? And what can I do and what can my students do to make sure that today isn't the last day? We're facing declining enrollments everywhere um, in all languages, not just in Latin, but it's a big problem because we have a lot to share with our students, but if they're not there, how are they going to learn it? So my class goals that I brought from all of this, I want to teach useful verbal skills that they can transfer to English, to any job that they're going to have, they're going to be able to use this. In any walk of life, um, the verbal skills that they learn as they're working to make themselves understood in Latin to another person will help them be better communicators in English. Uh, in their work and in their private lives. I definitely want to foster an appreciation of, of classical literature, um, but not just during the Roman period. There, Latin has this 2000 year span that we talked about earlier, and it's really important for students to understand the kinds of ideas that were talked about using the Latin language, well, Latin never stopped being used to discuss really important ideas. And that it's much bigger an arena than gladiators and the Colosseum, which is also important, and I want students to realize that. 
teaching students to think critically and independently is vital in our day in a time um, when I'm, I'm facing going home for Thanksgiving and uh, wondering what people think around the dinner table and how different they're going to be from what I expect or what I think. Um, politics, uh, talking about uh, the pandemic, it's a big, a big conversation. Um, I'm a little feeling a little trepidation about that. Teaching students to think critically and independently and not just go along with the crowd is huge and it's something that uh, I find important in my classes and to prepare students to take their place in society as as good citizens as as responsible good people um, and this was a huge finding in my research study that the the teachers who were teaching me active latin this was their main goal they wanted their students to be good people um, that's what they wanted from them they didn't necessarily care how well they could decline a noun that wasn't the big goal the big goal was what kind of people were they going to be as a result of reading the Latin literature that they're faced with. So what happens in my classes, probably the big thing that you're here, um, oral Latin, having students speak to each other in Latin, in pairs, in groups of three, back and forth with me, this allows me to integrate the grammar that I have to present. I only have a certain amount of time, a fixed amount of time with my students. And I want to make sure that they're going to be able to read independently when they leave me. Uh, I find that without using oral Latin, I waste a lot of time. Students are internalizing a lot of grammar just by having small conversations. And I'll talk about some of the prompts in a minute. Students also ask and answer questions in Latin about the texts. They're asking simple questions at first and the questions get to be more complicated. At first, they're just learning how questions work. Uh, but this again allows for an integration of grammar, but also for an understanding of what the text is saying. Keeping us in Latin saves a lot of time and creates a lot of interest among the students doing something they didn't think they were going to be able to do. Students also work together to compose simple sentences in group work. Um, and the really good part about this is this approach works with any text you have that you use. What I'm talking about doing um, recently, as, as recently as last year with the Cambridge Latin course and this year with Wheelocks. I can't think of any different, more different texts than those two. Um, just at the beginning level where they need a textbook to help uh, be able to look things up. So I also find it important to do the bulk of grammar explanation in English. When I'm teaching my classes, we have a lot of Latin that we're doing, but I don't explain the Latin grammar in Latin because I don't have enough time for that. Um, the students would be confused, it would take too long, and I also want to make sure that when they're speaking in Latin, it's fun. Otherwise, just human nature being what it is, they're less likely to want to do it. So I save the Latin conversation things for fun, and the harder parts happen when they're doing their composition where they're writing together in groups and they can kind of hash it out but when they're just speaking with each other they're speaking about things that they want to speak about um, within kind of parameters that i set up ahead of time but when i'm teaching grammar i keep it simple either i'm talking about a new grammatical construction or i'm using new vocabulary i don't do both at the same time so if the chapter is giving me new vocabulary, that's not the vocabulary that I'm going to use to illustrate the Latin examples. It's going to be vocabulary that the students knew already. Um, when they're learning the new vocabulary, they're using it to review grammar that they already learned about and that I know they're familiar with. Um, I, I find this really important to do because it's too much cognitive load to do two things at one time. 
it sounds like it should be quicker to do it this way. Each chapter you get new vocabulary and a new, uh, a new grammatical topic. Um, but it just wasn't sticking when I was doing that. Um, and one of my research participants made a point of saying that this is what she does as well. So some of the conversation prompts, starting from day one, greet your partner. So they learn how to say salve, they learn how to say salvete. And every time they come in the room, I greet them using different prompts. They start to figure out that they can say, Salve cease. What did you say when I came in that didn't sound like salve? So I'm using the greetings as they're coming in and I vary them. And then they start to be able to incorporate them into the conversation that they're using to greet their partner. Um, ask each other's names. So I've had the grammar greeting the partner. Um, there's, we're using imperatives. Now they're asking each other's names and there's going to be a dative case with pronouns here. This is going to be super later on when I want to talk about personal pronouns. They've got me, he, and TB um, that they've used and internalized and now they can see where it fits in with the grammar explanations that I'm presenting. Ask where your partner's from. This is, uh, there's, there's a lot, everybody seems to be from the same place, especially in a high school class, but in an online class, not necessarily. People are coming from different places. By asking where their partner's from, now they're getting into the kind of conversations that people have with each other. Um, they can say hello, they can find out somebody's name, they can find out where they're from. And later on, when I'm doing the locative, we have something to hang it on. Um, find out what foods your partner likes to eat. This is the great equalizer. Everybody has to eat. The students are interested in learning how to say different kinds of food. Um, this year's word seems to be crustulum. Uh, that's the one that everybody will say if they can't remember what else to say. Oh, I like to eat a cookie. Will come out a lot. It doesn't matter to me that that's something they're using over and over again because they've got a pattern and they're able to use it and they're able to be comfortable in the la in the language um talking about your family and if you don't want to talk about your family talk about a roman family or talk about the gods and goddesses now we're getting into larger conversations that take longer that require you to think a little harder uh, but still using familiar vocabulary, familiar grammatical constructions, and still getting your own ideas across. This is true composition. This isn't just translate one sentence from one language to another. Even if you're reusing kind of formulaic things at the beginning, um, you can't help that at the beginning. You have to start from somewhere. An example of a composition assignment um, or the direction, it, I give them kind of more guidance than this, but the basic assignment with your group, choose six of the images. You'll see the images that I, I gave them to pick from on the next slide. And then ask and answer questions based on the images. The students in their groups wrote six of their own questions, things they wanted to ask about pictures. Two of the questions started with the word esne, I got to them to this point by doing a lot of this in class where I would ask SNA and they would answer est or non est in a complete sentence to be able to tell yes or no. Two questions that start with quiz so that they're using the nominative case and they're understanding what the nominative case is on a visceral level. And two questions that start with quem so they can again, they can see the direct object. And here's the images that I chose. These were taken from Cambridge Latin course stages one and two, and they had to pick six of these in their group and then ask appropriate questions based on what they wanted to know. And here are some student responses. I just copied and pasted this to create this slide out of Canvas from a submission from a group. Um, this is after they had an opportunity to have it corrected by me. So this is the second submission that they did. Um, they asked from, let's go back to picture five and we'll just go over this one for a second. So picture five, oh, here we go, sorry, has uh, 
somebody standing with a trowel. So you could ask, you know, um, a lot of things, but you ha would have to know the vocabulary to fit because that was the rule. The rule was don't start with English and go looking up words to figure out what to say. The rule was say something you know how to say about the picture and then ask a question about it from that. Um, so the, they they composed it in that order and they had a lot of guidance. This was a super successful assignment. The students liked it and they were surprised at their ability to do it. Um, so they asked quist est in horto. Clemens is the name of the character est in horto. And you can see the rest of these. Check the time. But you can also do this. Um, here are sentences from Wheelock's Latin, chapters one and two. They can do a similar task. Starting with sentences, uh, I asked them to choose six of the eight sentences. And if you notice, there were no sentences here that have asked. Esne questions didn't happen until a later, little later using this book. That's how you adapt it based on kind of what you're using with the book and how you're getting there. Quem habent puellae, this is before uh, my, my discussions with the students. Um, so whom do the girls have? Well, they have a friend. That's pretty good. Uh, it could be quam, but quem is also good for that because when you ask the question, you don't know the gender of the answer. Um, quem weedimus. Uh, filium now tie in agri sweetimus. So they base these, these are pulled from the students' um, work directly. Another problem that came up in the pandemic, okay, office hours, they're there and students don't come to them. And to try to get students to come to my office to work with me has been a struggle. But during the pandemic, it became impossible to get them to come to the Zoom. Uh, I would remind them, I'm on Zoom now, please come in. Finally, I asked them during a, a synchronous class session, why aren't you coming? And they're very polite and kind, oh, I don't wanna bother you. This is the time when you're supposed to be in your office working, it's your office hours. Literally not realizing what the purpose is. And it didn't matter how many times I said, no, no, I'm in my office so that you'll come to me. It didn't seem to help. And I renamed the office hour to study session. Um, and that helped a little bit, but what really helped is saying, I'm going to run a study session and I'm going to discuss uh, how to conjugate a verb. And students would come to that, or I'm going to run a study session. Let's have a practice conversation. And I found that students came specifically during the pandemic um, students really needed a lot of extra assurance. They, they seem to be a little more unsure of themselves um, and they don't want to transgress. They don't want to come to the Zoom unless you've really invited them individually. So that's one way that I did that. Beyond the first and second semesters though, so I'm not only teaching Latin to beginners, what happens after you're done with the very basic beginning and you can ask and answer questions about a text and you can understand what texts are saying with simple sentences. At this point, there's a greater and greater focus in my classes on texts from all the eras when Latin was written. This is what we do at the University of Kentucky. We're all about the fact that Latin has a very wide span when Latin was used, when Latin was written, and Latin you could read that people don't even realize, for example, that Thomas More wrote Utopia in Latin. They think it's just an English text. I also provide students choice and variety of what they're going to do and what they're going to read within certain parameters. So I may select uh, five or six different texts and ask them to pick which one they want to read next. Um, and I find that there's a lot more investment from students when the, they get that opportunity, especially in the pandemic. Um, we're in a different kind of time than we were now, and students aren't just 
showing up now. Um, they have to be invited in uh, on a deeper level in order to talk with you or else they'll have their cameras off if you're on Zoom. Uh, they won't speak even when you ask them to, even when they go into breakout rooms. So giving them choice and offering a variety, uh, I find helps the students to talk. And even in the classroom in the times of the pandemic when everybody's got a mask on, the choice and variety and the conversations help the students to be able to overcome these difficulties in communication um, that seem to have been exacerbated by the pandemic. So in the upper level, students have a lot more opportunities to review vocabulary in advance because they're not remembering vocabulary from every chapter. They can't hold that stuff in their head. They're surviving a pandemic and remembering anything now is harder than it used to be. You have a lot more to worry about. So making sure that students understand how I want them to review vocabulary. Um, for example, when, when there's, they're assigned a text, I will ask them to read it aloud three or four times. That's the main homework. Read it aloud three or four times and think about the words in there that you know already. Because if they, they don't know the first word in the text, automatically they're going to go straight for a dictionary or a glossary or a Google Translate or wherever they go. And they're not going to think at all about what the text is saying to them that they understand. And so they never really internalize vocabulary because they never feel sure enough. By asking them to review the vocabulary that they know already before they start looking something up, I've found a lot of success. Um, also asking students to only look up maybe 10 words and don't don't be looking up words for four hours you don't have to do that to do this homework assignment limit it i provide some explanation for how the grammar works with them when they get stuck we focus on whatever grammar is needed but the whole lesson is not about all the grammar throughout the text there is a review of previous grammatical items there's review of previous vocabulary, but the most important part to me is when we get to the discussions of what the text means and the implications for the students. Um, and again, this is how the students are invested and what makes them want to come the next day. So for example, reading Carmen five of Catullus. Sure, there's a lot of grammar that we can talk about. We can, I, I could probably put my annotate feature on an underline different things that we could talk about. The, we've got subjunctives, um, we've got pause with a complementary infinitive, the ever famous passive periphrastic. There's lots of things that you can talk about in grammar here. But what I want to get to, uh, I want to get to the point where the students understand what Catullus is asking for and say, um, are you convinced? Do you give in if you're lesbian? What do you think happened? Do you think that she was persuaded? And their answers. He's a creeper. Mini me. Wow. Really, Catullus? Ooh, intense. That came from two different men in the room. Intense. Uh, but lots of no, 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 no. Creepy, creeper. Mini me made me happy because they said it in Latin. This is this is true. This is a, a word art from the responses from the students. Um, so now when when I've read uh, Carpe Diem, Horace's ode here with the students and we talk a little bit about the grammar and we talk about the vocabulary and we ask questions like just how does uh, winter wear down the sea? Like, can that really happen? what what's going on there but the the big question to ask students who's more persuasive are you more likely to give in to horace than you were to catullus they didn't think he was creepy they'd rather have a beer with horace than with catullus um and it, certainly that these aren't the only poems that they've read by the authors 
But getting to these questions, it feels like sometimes, uh, even when you read textbooks, these kinds of questions aren't in there. There's only questions about the grammar and about the vocabulary and what case is this noun? And do you see the ablative absolute? Um, but this is where students are going to take something away later on. So back to the beginning, uh, I said that I wanted to teach the elements of Latin so that the students are invested. Uh, I started by integrating research into practice and putting in four communication modes into my classes and asking myself, what if this is all there is? Um, that would be very sad for me if this is all that there is. Cassandra Fidelli had an answer for that. Um, she seems to think that even for women who in her time shouldn't be uh, learning Latin, this was a prevailing theory, um, that Latin is relevant even if, even if all you get out of it is enjoyment. Um, and she kind of quotes Cicero in one of her orations and she says, um, you know, speaking and thinking is what sets us apart from the animals, uh, quoting Cicero pretty much verbatim. Um, Latin is more relevant now than ever as I'm heading to that Thanksgiving dinner table uh, to find out uh, just what kind of people I'm going to be sitting with and how the pandemic changed them uh, and what they think about things. And my students are, are experiencing the same. And so thank you very much for your kind attention. I would love to hear questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, everyone is silently <laughs> clapping. Some are using emojis. Some are doing it the old fashioned way. Um, we definitely do have time for questions. So uh, if anyone would like to ask one, you can raise your hand. Uh, and we'll call on you, or you can, if you feel like it, you can type it in the chat and then I'll read it out and Laura will respond. Any questions from anyone? Uh, we have, um, hi, Maya. Hi, I th Mayor, <laughs> is it pronounced? I, I've, I've known you for a long time, but I, don't, I, don't, I confess yeah. I don't, yeah, I've never I known think... how to, yeah. I think you've mostly known me in writing. And yeah, Ma <laughs> that makes it's it Mayor. Great to, it's, great to it's, meet it's you. Myra, yeah. actually. Ma Myra, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nice very to meet similar. you, Myra. Nice to meet you too, Jason. Lovely. All right. Yeah, so uh, I, I was very interested, Laura, in, in your finding of correlation between the having all the four modes there. Um, and uh, and what, was, what did you find it correlated with? All four modes promoting success? Or? Um, it, it, it's really great that you're asking that because really, for the most part, there were 40 questions on this test and there was no statistical difference in, um, 21 of them. So <laughs> half the questions, they were pretty much the same where the differences were, um, a lot of, there were a lot of differences in the gr grammatical questions. When there was this balance, the students seemed to have internalized the grammar better. And again, it's very limited. I only had three classes. It was only the students who agreed to take the test, uh, whose scores that I looked at for this. So it, you know, it's just a beginning. But I, I did find that there's something there that we can look at yeah, yeah. and see what we get later. Yeah. And would you say that that was pointing towards? like equal time spent on the four modes or just making sure they're all present? I found that the, the more equal it was, the better they did. So there, there was one group where there was very little uh, Latin spoken and they did okay. And again, they, you know, um, it was all right. There was another class where the teacher spoke in Latin all the time and the students did very little speaking on their own. And they did, they did a little better. This was a more experienced teacher than the first teacher. Um, so there could be a lot of reasons there. Um, and in the, the last class was the, was the medium teacher in terms of how many years teaching. Um, but the students did a lot of speaking in this class. The teacher did a lot of speaking in this class. They also did a lot of reading and writing, a lot. Um, and 
they just aced the grammar questions really well. Um, if, if someone was going to do better, if one class was going to excel, it was that class. I, I don't know if there's more to it than that. Again, I, I spent um, something like nine hours of transcripts from each class. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, more research to do, eh? Yes, there's more to do. <laughs> Keep us in business. Yeah. OK, thank you, Myra. Um, we've got a couple more questions. First, Eric Hansen, and then uh, TJ Howell. Hi, Laura. How are you? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm wondering today, can you talk for a little bit, Laura, about how you manage um, when students are composing writing, um, balancing sort of rectitude of grammar versus um, just expression and letting things go? So when they're writing, I ask them to keep it very simple because I have said, if you're writing, you have plenty of time to look at all of your resources. If you're speaking, I don't put that much emphasis on, you know, we're, we're trying to get our thoughts across. And even in English, in your first language, people have a little trouble. When they're writing, I want them to write stuff they know how to write. And mm -hmm. that's why they're working in groups. They have each other to proofread, to check things out. Um, and why I ask them to write things they know how to say. I also give them some samples that they can model on. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're writing, I want them to not take too many risks, not at the beginning, not in this, this first couple semesters. Uh, it's, it's too hard and I want it to not be unpleasant and too difficult. So, so then I assume, so if then if mistakes are made, you would correct them. I help in, them in that correct circumstance. Them. You would help them correct them. I yes. help them correct them. That's some of the feedback they get. And then they get the opportunity to go back. So I don't tell them what the correct answer is. I mm -hmm. tell them, take a look at the case here. There's something off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll highlight the word and ask them, you know, generally what to look at. And then they'll go back and they'll correct it. And if they need to correct it a second time, they do that as well. Um, and I learned this from our graduate program. The professors are very generous in allowing you to correct things and they guide you and where to go. I found mm -hmm. it really helpful for me and my students seem to find it helpful too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Next is TJ. Hi, Laura. Thanks for the talk. Um, exciting to get to hang out with everybody on a Sunday. Um, so my question, Laura, is about um, sort of moving from um, you know, you said some very interesting things about production and, you know, there's some controversy, um, in the SLA research community about like how much production is actually necessary. Um, you know, your, your study seemed to indicate that production does actually have an effect on overall, um, ability. Um, so I'm interested in, in if you wanted to say a little bit more about that. Um, but my real question, um, is about, um, a lot of people who are in the active speaking community or who are just starting out with this Latin speaking community um, kind of end their production level at like the, the, the word or sentence response. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of, you know, it's not like what you see at like a Paideia conference or another uh, or a conventiculum in which there's actual real conversation, right? And so like what's your experience and thoughts about how to, how to build out from, uh, you know, just so that kids aren't still saying minime is their answer when they have taken Latin for a bunch of years, but can actually begin to, you know, um, express themselves um, extemporaneously more. So the, two really interesting questions there, um, kind of related. Um, so there is second language acquisition research that says you shouldn't force anybody to do anything, but I don't think you should force anybody to do anything. I'm inviting students to do it and I'm creating an environment where they want to. And I'm also giving them patterns that they can follow at first to be able to communicate. Um, and I've done this with students as young as sixth grade with great success. Uh, at about 12 years old, linguistically, you're an adult and they don't need years of silence to be able to absorb everything from us. They want to communicate. You can tell. You can tell they want to communicate 
when they have to turn to each other and speak in English to get their thoughts out. So then for me, the question is, how do I kind of use that to fuel the conversation in Latin? Well, I listen to the things that people want to say. And at the end of the time when they're talking, I'll even ask them, was there something you wanted, really wanted to say and you couldn't figure out how to say it? Let's figure out how to say it together. And just acknowledging the fact that they're doing something a little weird and a little different and a little out of the comfort zone seems to be enough. I haven't had students that are just um, drop the class because they've been asked to turn and talk to somebody at all. So in terms of the SLA research, I think if you do it like a humanist, which we all are here, where you're trying to um, tap into the commonalities of you know what we are as human beings and you're kind, and I'm not grading the students. Everyone's talking at the same time. I'm not calling on student X in the corner and saying, okay, tell us what you think about this topic in Latin and let's hear it. That's a, that's a little much. Um, the, what was the other half of the question? Oh, right. So the other half was, um, what's your experience and tips for, um, for moving students from the ability to answer with a single or very basic response to be able to speak a little bit more extemporaneously about what they feel and think about, um, you know, something familiar that you're talking about in class. Mm -hmm. So we start with really simple conversations like solving, you know, you say hello to somebody um, and then you learn different ways to do that. After a while, they start to be able to make their own little substitutions for words. So if they learn to talk about the horse, now they've learned the word of the dog and now they can talk about their dog a little bit. Um, and I find that it's kind of gradual, but I'm not, I'm not grading this and I'm not grading on their variety of what they can say. I'm listening for when does the conversation start to switch to English. Um, and I'm hearing from everybody sentences after a while. Um, at, when I get to the point where I say, talk about your families, try to say three or four sentences, they can do it. But I don't expect that on day one. And I don't count either in case they're not getting there. I don't get a lot of just minime, but it was really funny when they, when they said that about Catullus. Um, Did somebody ask something in the chat? Yeah, I'll, I'll read it out so everyone hears it. So this is William Dolan asking, um, do your students complete Cambridge Latin course through stage 40 or 48? before you transition them to authentic texts? Or do you find that speaking allows you to move out of the textbook sooner? So we use the Cambridge Latin course at the University of Kentucky for only a limited amount of time. And then we made a switch to a different textbook. Um, when you're getting to the later stages, the texts are more authentic already so students are able to do it and i tend to bring something in in the, the first second semester first and second semester i bring in some easy authentic texts right away um, students can see that there's a difference uh, it's not following the story and we don't have Romeo and all the other characters uh, but they're also realizing that they're getting to do something that they signed up for which is to find out how people who used to use Latin, when everybody was using Latin, what did they talk about and what kinds of things are there? Um, so I introduce a lot of it maybe earlier. Uh, I, don't, I don't wait until we've done all the grammar before we start doing uh, authentic, if you want to call them authentic texts, uh, texts written by speakers of native ability uh, is the way I like to say it. Did that answer your question? Awesome. All right. Um, are there any other questions or comments? OK, well, um, I hope you'll then join me in thanking Laura for her wonderful um, presentation. Uh, this uh, this talk has been recorded, 
and it will be edited and posted on our YouTube channel um, for uh, any of you who want to go back and check it out. Um, I can also recommend uh, a few of our upcoming talks. We have one talk on um, uh, learning Latin in old age by a woman named uh, uh, Ann, Ann Patty, who uh, I guess I should say learning Latin in retirement. That's probably a nicer way to say it. Uh, uh, who who was a, um, a really successful editor. Uh, she's actually the, um, the, the woman who discovered what's eating Gilbert Grape and Life of Pi while she was working as a, a book editor for a, a major publisher in New York. And, um, uh, and then when she retired, uh, she decided she was gonna learn Latin. And so she wrote a, a book called Living with a Dead Language, which is about her experience learning Latin uh, in retirement. And so that should be really good. And then also coming up, uh, we have a, um, a talk about podcasting. Uh, there's a, um, some of you may know Alex Petkus. He's a classicist um, who did his PhD at Princeton, then got a job teaching in California for a while, but then ended up leaving academia to uh, get into the business world. But he's kept up his connection to classics through podcasting. And he has a new podcast out which is called uh, very dramatically the Cl the cost of glory, and it's um it's it's a it's a retelling of Plutarch's lives basically. So um, he'll be um, he'll be visiting and uh, talking about sort of the you know experience of trying to translate ancient literature uh, into a podcast audience uh, into a format for a podcast. Um, so the the talk with Anne is on. Um, December 4th, and then Alex is on the 14th. And you can always see everything that's going on uh, if you visit the hideinstitute.org slash online lectures, um, where we have the whole list of everything there. So that's, uh, that's my little epilogue. Thank you again, Laura. I wish everyone a happy Sunday and uh, a great week ahead. Take care. Uh, John, write to me if you uh, want me to give you the link to my dissertation. Thank you all. All right. I'm going to pull the plug. Bye. Bye. Pulling it.